Spider Webb, 
Spider Web came and playing as a manager under the entrepreneur in 1915, stayed uh, to ultimately have semi pro teams that would find their way touring the country. Uh, I'm going to stop for a second and recognize uh, a guy who knew Billy Webb and who was the mascot, if you will, for team and now is a prominent attorney. Just so we can stand up and we can acknowledge him, Park Cashman. Park. who got this project in the high energy mode. He referred to the book Across the Seams and mentioned that the fact that it was virtually devoid of the great semi-pro era which involved the spiders. It was that task that we sought to remedy in this project. Park mentions the Homestead Grays, the House of David, Swat Erickson, Vince McNamara, Nate Dreyer, Lehman Peterson, we'll all learn about them in this movie. Thanks, Park, for the inspiration. This is the story about the early days of baseball. It is the story of what it was like and how it felt to be a baseball player at the turn of the century and in the decades shortly thereafter. This is also the story of America at the turn of the century and prior to World War I, a time of cobblestone streets and horse-drawn trolleys. It is the story of young man's hopes, his struggles, his triumphs and his failures in what history has recorded as the quiet time. It is about the time when the fate of young men was seen as their own doing, and hard work was viewed as the pathway to success. It is about the time of carriages and handsome cabs, and the time when some men looked to the sky. It is about the time in baseball when Ty Cobb would win 12 batting championships in 13 years and had a 371 average in the one year he didn't win. It is about the time when home run champions could win the title with six or 10 or 19. Time of William Monterwill Webb, also known as Billy Webb, who was born in Homestead, Pennsylvania on October 22nd, 1888. His mother was Harriet Bile, who was from the Philadelphia area. His father was Robert Webb, who was a carpenter born in Limerick, which is between Pottstown and Reading, Pennsylvania. His father worked for the railroad, and they ended up in Homestead, Pennsylvania, which is near Pittsburgh. We believe he worked near the Carnegie Steel Plant during this time period. What was Homestead all about? Homestead, there's only one primary factor. You had to think about that mill that stretched about three miles along the Monongahela River, Homestead, Pennsylvania. And most blacks worked in that Homestead mill. It was the town, and when you tied that in with the Homestead Grays, you're talking about one of the prized possessions of the black community. Moved back into the Philadelphia area, presumably after the Carnegie Steel plant strike of 1892 where the Webbs probably along with several other employees chose to leave the area and find other work. This is when Billy became known in the Philadelphia area. Here is his first team, the Ambler Baseball Club. Billy is in the middle of the picture and he is the shortstop at age 19. In 1909, Billy played in Bridgeton Park near Philadelphia. He was referred to in an article as a clever little shortstop who started in 1909 with the Southwark team before joining Bridgeton. He was described as in the winter he is the assistant stage manager of the Chestnut Street Opera House in Philadelphia. He was described as a young man with great prospects for a professional baseball career. 
Billy was already signed up for the 1910 season when the word came out that the Millville baseball management had decided no longer to continue its support. This came as a shock not only to Billy, but to several other players. That ultimately led to Billy coming to Jamestown, New York. Here's the story. Dave Mulay's insightful book, Across the Seams, concerning the history of professional baseball in Jamestown, gives us some information. 1910, when Hugh Shannon, the well-known to the local fans, was handling the Jamestown semi-pro team, he invited Webb, along with five other Philly lads, to come here for a tryout. Unfortunately, the whole gang did not get a chance to try out, and this made them rather sore, and they decided to go back home. On the day they figured to leave, they were at the train station. The secretary of the local club met them and told them to wait at least one train and that the directors were going to hold a meeting. This was done, and one of the Philly lads, Frank Corneal, was signed up to handle the team, and Webb was given a job a job he would maintain until his death in 1935. The Jamestown Evening Journal of May 9, 1910 announced the news that William Webb, a third baseman who also comes from Sleepy Town, will try out for the third bag. This is the first mention of Billy Webb in our newspapers. However, this would not be his last mention in 1910, for it was in August that it was announced that Billy Webb would take as a bride, Myrtle Miller. Myrtle was a big fan and supporter of baseball and Billy. 1912 census found Billy and Myrtle living on Melvin Avenue in Celeron, New York. From 1910 through 1913, Billy played with Jamestown and Celeron at Celeron Park in their semi-pro leagues. 1914 would be a year of change for Billy Webb, a change for the good. He would move to Duquesne, Duquesne Avenue in Celeron, New York, have his first child, Kate, And on April 11, 1914, the Warren Evening Times indicated that William Webb was elected manager of the professional baseball team in Warren known as the Warren Bingos in the Interstate League. Now he was a pro. A league consisting of seven teams. Billy Webb was an immediate hit in Warren. At the Chamber of Commerce meeting, it was, it was expressed that his clean-cut appearance and his business-like manner was of great effect. When he said that the players who will represent Warren on the diamond this year were of the kind to reflect the highest credit of the city, both on and off the field, he awakened much enthusiasm. Billy's Webb's team finished second. The team finished second to Jamestown during this initial interstate league. However, Jamestown's success on the field was not reflected in the box office. So they sought to bring the very ever popular Billy Webb to Jamestown and Warren agreed to its release. It was apparent that Jamestown had to have a strong team in order for the league to survive. Billy Webb immediately had to put together a team as it was already March when he was appointed. One of his first acquisitions was local Leon Carlson. The opening game of the 1915 season was pitched by Leon, and the team was known as the Rabbits. Leon would go on to greater fame in making the big leagues in 1920 with the Washington Senators. He pitched three relief appearances, all in relief of the great Walter Johnson. As it was told, his first relief appearance, being extremely nervous, he came in and faced Babe Ruth, where he fortunately got the Babe uh, to strike out on a call strike three. Leon was busting his buttons with the success he had with this Babe Ruth. One of the players on the bench reminded Leon, saying the Babe's day would come. 
And sure enough, it would. Two days later, Carlson again came in to face Ruth. And as Leon tells it, I gave him one low and outside, as the catcher advised before. Ruth let it go, dug in a little, and waited. I came in with another one, a little higher. Ruth swung. It was gone. This was the longest home run I ever saw. Another pitcher that year was Bugs Eccles, a Kennedy native who earlier in the season had pitched for the Philadelphia Athletics. He pitched five games that year, starting one, and had an 0-1 record. Incredible when you think about it, that earlier in the year he was with the Philadelphia Athletics and Connie Mack, and later in the year he'd be pitching with the Jamestown Rabbits in the Interstate League. The 1915 team did not fare very well. Billy tried a little bit of everything at the Cell Around Park in 1915, including a fly-in by uh, Aviatrix. However, attendance continued to lag, and on July 13th, Jamestown baseball terminated in the professional leagues. Billy Webb resigned as manager. However, he did leave some lasting images here as a third baseman. Note the kiosk in center field towards Chautauqua Lake. And here's a play at third base with Billy sliding in. Note the right field. And thanks to Billy Webb's daughter Joan, we have these terrific images of action shots during the Interstate League. Nineteen fifteen, former Jamestown Interstate League manager Joe Lore and Billy Webb, together with Layman Peterson, created a unique opportunity in the Floss Palace bowling alleys, which was opposite the Hotel Samuels in the Wellman Building. They created a baseball batting court similar to today's batting cage. Unbelievable. The guy at the stool would control the velocity of the pitch. You can see Billy on the left observing. Or first in James Hunt. Coupled with Billy's love of baseball was his love of bowling. Billy in 1912 was employed at the Floss Palace Bowling Alleys and continued in that capacity through 1916 when it closed. Thereafter, he became closely associated with James Brooks of the Freebrook Bowling Alley, where he went from clerk to assistant manager to manager of alleys which were located at 209 Pine Street. Billy was not only a bowling executive, but also a bowling participant, and he, together with Park Catchpole's father, traveled throughout the area garnering many awards. In the last years of Billy's life, he operated the Spring Street Bowling Alley, and that is where he and his daughter, Kate, became very close. Kate would go on to be an extremely proficient bowling herself, holding the city all-time league record for a woman for over nine years. In the early 1920s, the Duck Pin League Results indicated that Billy Webb's team was known as Webb's Spiders. It would be this name which would become more widely known in the baseball world. For it was not for bowling that Billy became forever known in this area, but for his baseball legacy. After the collapse of the 1915 interstate team, Billy Webb remained in his adopted city of Jamestown and continued to play with various local teams. In 1920, a semi-pro team was created under the aegis of Jake Pittler. Jake, the man who would play havoc as manager of Olean against our Falcons during the formative Pony League years of 1939 through 1941, created the Oil City and Jamestown Independence. It was the first semi-pro team in the area during the 20s. It lasted until July of 1920 when it folded. On August 3rd, 1920, a newly organized Jamestown Independent Club was created under the management of George Maltby, 
who was the manager of the Jamestown Railway Company and the Celeron Amusement Parks. One of the stars of the team was Billy Webb, together with young shortstop Lehman Peterson. Maltby managed after the irregularly scheduled 1921 season ended, George Maltby turned the reins of the semi-pro team over to Billy Webb. The local sports pundits dubbed the new semi-pro team as Billy Webb's Spiders, the same name used for the bowling team. Soon, that name had become synonymous with baseball excellence. One of the earliest examples of Billy Webb's entrepreneurship dealt with the biggest attraction in baseball. The owners of Selron Park were contacted by Babe Ruth's agents to schedule a barnstorming game here in October of 1921. Enter Billy Webb, who in turn prevailed upon our local hero, Faulkner's Hugh Bedian, to pitch and his newly formed Spiders to provide the players. However, that is only part of the story. On the base swing, it's a long run, a long run going out toward right center. Thing was backing up against the wall. He can't get it. It's in there. Another home run for the Bambino. So the base is his second home run of the day.
Perfect glow of the Babe Ruth success, the spiders of Billy Webb took true form in 1922. More about this glorious era, which started in 1922 and ran through 1935, Billy Webb and his famous spiders. Person. Billy Webb? Yeah, I knew Billy Webb, not personal, but I'd, I'd talked to him. And Billy Webb was a, a little short guy, kind of bow-legged. But he, he was a good manager. He could manage that team, you know. He had good ball players, and he was he never had any trouble with them. But in later years at Red Elm and, uh, and Steve Sandy Junta, you remember Sandy Junta? Are you good? Uh, He's a dentist. He's in Warren. Anyway. Did they play, did they play a lot? Did no, they played mainly on Sundays. Mainly on Sundays. In Southern Park. They, uh, they imported a lot of players from Buffalo. Mm -hmm. They had very few Jamestown players on the club. I remember Eddie Crow, Al Gieb, from Buffalo, they were outfielders. They brought in a Roth from Altoona. He was a good ball player. They brought a catcher by the name of Dutch Grenet. And uh, there were maybe one or two players from Jamestown. That was all. But they were known as the Jamestown Spiders. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the organizer of the team was Billy Webb. He played third base for the for this team. And uh, I think Vince McNamara played short on the Spiders. Went on and became the president of the Pony League. And, uh, the man in the middle of this 1930 Spiders photo is shortstop Vince McNamara. And his participation is playing in Selwyn Park for Billy Webb Spiders. I know by reading about it and sitting around the, uh, the uh, coffee shops and people talking about Vince's uh, playing baseball there. I picked up a thing the other night. The thing that struck me so forcefully about this guy just coming through this book. They talk about Sauron was a village on Chautauqua Lake about three miles west of Jamestown in southwestern New York, whose sole claim to attention was a big amusement park. I remember that very well. Uh, on the decoration day, we would go out there, put on our uniforms and pray from Sauron Park over to the ballpark, which was just around the corner. And uh, we would not get paid for that, that day down there. We'd take that money and Billy Webb would invest it in rain insurance. So we never got raised that down there. I remember that. But. but was Hugh Bedian pitching at the time? Uh, Hugh, Hugh, Hugh Bedian was pitching for the Spiders, and so was Swat. And then it was uh, Drescher was pitching for him, too. Yeah, Jacobson was playing first. Did you remember Jake? Young Parker. He, and uh, Lehman Peterson was on third. I'm trying to think who was who the other guys were. I, I was quite young then. On the evening of May 24th, 1935, Larry McPhail, general manager of the Cincinnati Reds, arranged for President Franklin D. Roosevelt to push a button in the White House that lit up Crosley Field in Cincinnati for a game between the Reds and the Philadelphia Phillies. Although the Kansas City Monarchs had used portable lights for years, this was the first night game in Major League history.
The Reds won two to one. Game to be illuminated in southwestern New York was held on Saturday, August 9th, 1930, five years prior to the first Major League game, and it was at Celeron Park. You guessed it, Billy Webb brought in the California Owls and their artificial illumination system. This was big news. The headline stated, Night Baseball Comes to Jamestown on Saturday. Other headlines in other papers, Night Game at Celeron Park stirs up fans. Finally, the headlines read, Billy Webb's fast traveling outfit makes debut under electric lights. Six workers, three trucks, one power plant, and tons of related paraphernalia arrived two days before the big event. The Celeron ballpark was deemed ideally adapted for the equipment. The headline speaks for itself. As for the game, 1,000 people came out to note that the Billy Webb's Spiders proved that they could win ball games not only in the daytime but in the dark as well. However, there were some various humorous sidelines. Waddy Erson was not scheduled to pitch, however, he became an active participant in the game. Swatty Erickson came in from center field carrying a large lantern, which he used in the coaching box during the game. He swung the lantern like a brake man in signaling runners at third, keeping the fans in a continual uproar. Scores in the press box managed to keep a record of the game with the aid of flashlights and matches. Ball players from the Jamestown area was Eric Swat Erickson. He played with the Washington Senators, the Detroit Tigers, and the New York Giants. After his major league career, he came back to Jamestown. Vince has his recollections of a unique experience at Celeron Park. And I remember going back to one of my favorite guys, all the guys are favorites, Scott Erickson. Scott, formerly of the Detroit Tigers. Scott, we played a, the first night ball game ever played here. Scott was involved there in the affordable lights. They had the generators there out in the outfield making noise. They had the, lights up on poles and windows poles and shaking like that. And nothing new, but before every game here, where you played, twi played twilight ball, the guys would park the cars in the outfield and the lights on, you could, you could get an extra inning in. But they did that that night, but that didn't help too much. But SWAT, before the ball game, everything is dark in the ballpark. Everything is dark. And in through the center field comes SWAT Erickson carrying a lantern. <laughs> so are the kind of guys we had down here in this they, they certainly got a charge on us. They got a hundred bucks a game if they pitched. And if they sit on the bench, they got 50. <laughs> How did that pitch describe with the overhand pitcher side the Right straight overhand. Yeah. You, you can't throw them sidearm because they'll get you every time. <laughs> what was the specialty in the overhead pitch? I don't know. He had a fastball that kind of went like that. Because <laughs> I used to catch him up there. Just he'd, he'd throw easy, you know. But he never throw right at me because he figured if I missed it, he's going to hit me right in the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was only about 12 years old. <laughs> together uh, years later and it was an interesting comment yeah they'd get together it'd get towards uh, time to start playing ball up in Sullivan Park and uh, so then my dad would go down there to the gas station that's where they'd warm up spring training <laughs> between the gas pumps <laughs> car come in to get gas well then they would take a break <laughs> Uh, Joe Bedian, he was, a, he was a good pitcher. <coughs> he was a heady pitcher. Yeah, and Squat, he was firing them in there like, <laughs> you need fire them so hard that you just and sit there and wiggle you. Yeah. <laughs> when James Thompson, when, when he, when he and, and uh, Squat Erickson both pitched for the Spiders, uh, Squat had a lot more stuff, but he didn't have the control. You know, I said, if, if Hugh had Swat stuff, he had been unbeatable. <laughs> but uh, 
interview, Billy Webb claimed that his top thrill in baseball was managing his Jamestown Spiders against the Boston Braves on August 6, 1930. The venerable Swat Erickson would claim that it was his top thrill in baseball. Swat Erickson was 35 years old and eight years removed from his last major league game with the Washington Senators. He was to start that day, and little did he realize that he would pitch and pitch so well that in going into the ninth inning, he would have a no-hitter going against the Major League team of the Boston Braves. The team consisted of the likes of Wally Berger, Hank Gowdy, and future Hall of Famer George Sisler. Earlier, in the bottom of the second, the Spiders loaded the bases, and Swat Erickson strode to the plate. After taking the first two deliveries, Erickson laced a double past the reach of star outfielder Wally Berger, clearing the bases. The score, three to nothing, would be maintained entering into the ninth inning. With one out in the top of the ninth and the crowd ever excited, pinch hitter Lance Richborg hit what was described as a, quote, seeing eye, end of quote, single to break up the no-hitter. His no-hitter was gone, but his fame would continue. The final score was 3 to nothing, and Swat Erickson had beat the mighty Braves, and elation swept over the crowd. Twenty-seven and thirty. That was with the Spiders. Yeah. That was their semi-pro team, played in the cellar. And uh, they brought uh, Boston Braves in for an exhibition game. Hank Gowdy, you know, the great Hank Gowdy, was, was a catcher. They didn't use their first string lineup that day, but I, th I think he, he, he allowed one hit, Swat, and that was to an outfit. The Red Sox came there once for an exhibition game, and he beat them. Then they wanted him to go to play ball with them. So Billy Webb was running the ball club here, he told him he had to have, I don't know how much money if he was going to go. There wasn't ever any contract for this, you know. That close to right there. He wouldn't have went anyway because he had back trouble if he played too much. Between him and Beatty. With him and Swat Erickson, what another jewel. Those are the fellows that made, made it easy for me to play, to enjoy playing. And I, I remember when Swat Erickson shot out the Boston Bees with one hit. Yeah, they, with two outs in the night, they put a pinch hitter in, and he, he had beaten him. He had scored the, the driven in a winning run. And I, I recall Swat that day, how happy he was in the dressing room after. Celeron Park was a small village just outside Jamestown. And it was built as a typical trolley park in 1894. It was an unusually active place and one of the largest on the East Coast. It had a giant Phoenix wheel, large summer stock theater, bandstand, picnic area, and, of course, a baseball. 1920s was a site which entertained children of all ages. In fact, one of Celeron's most noted natives was Lucille Ball, and she and her family have special memories of Celeron Park. Back in with Grandpa Hunt. My grandfather used to take us to Vaudeville every Saturday. And I grew to love it. So all I knew is I wanted to be in vaudeville and I wanted to make people laugh. I certainly didn't want to make them cry, you know. Celeron Park. That was a very important part of my life and Lucy's life, too. 
uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful place. Oh, and that big uh, Phoenix wheel, and of course we uh, would go to the theater when we could. Closed for the season. There is a catcher that any big league club would like to buy for $200,000. His name is Gibson. He can do everything. He hits the ball a mile, and he catches so easy, he might as well be in a rocking chair. Throws like a rifle. Too bad this Gibson is a color fella. Walter Johnson. Josh Gibson was black baseball's greatest home run hitter and after Satchel Paige, its biggest crowd pleaser. A sharecropper's son from Buena Vista, Georgia, he was brought north to Pittsburgh when his father moved there to work in the steel mills. His first love was swimming, and he planned to be an electrician until he discovered there was better money to be made in baseball. He broke in with the Homestead Grays in 1930 and quickly proved himself so good that Gus Greenlee stole him for the Crawfords. He hit more than 70 home runs in 1931 alone, some of them soaring better than 575 feet, and his lifetime record may have approached 950. Legend had it that Gibson hit a ball so hard at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh that it never came down. The next day, Gibson was playing in Philadelphia, 300 miles away, when a ball dropped from the heavens into an outfielder's glove. The umpire pointed at Gibson and shouted, you're out, yesterday in Pittsburgh. Between the Homestead Grays on July 25th, 1930, one month later to the day, Billy Webb brought the Homestead Grays to Celeron Park, and there was Josh Gibson, together with future Hall of Famers Oscar Charleston and Judy Johnson. Leave it to Billy Webb. One year later, the Homestead Grays came back to Celeron, and the headlines read, Homestead Grays go on batting spree and defeat Spiders 10 to 4. Hugh Bedient rocked. But of particular interest is a small footnote. The note states, Gibson, catcher for the Grays, hit a towering run in the seventh, the ball clearing the trees in center field. Gibson was three for five on the day. The shortstop, Vince McNamara, recalls that day vividly. The, the good black guy was the best catcher of all time. A great friend of you, beat it. And I remember one day in the ballpark out here when he and his, uh, what the heck was his name? Gibson. Oh, Josh Gibson. Gibson, Josh Gibson. That's right, thank you. I remember how he and you used to kid when I was like hell. And I remember one day out here in the ballpark, Josh Gibson told Huey, he said, Huey, I'm going to hit that tree out there in right center field with a light drive. <laughs> and old Huey was a grand guy. He smiled, he said, you are like hell. <laughs> well, when he came up to hit, uh, you threw one of his good curves at him. Josh dropped his left leg back and opened up wide, and by God, he didn't hit the ball, line drive, first ball to hit that tree. Boy, what a hitter he was. He was a great hitter. But that was the thing that I enjoyed most, looking back on my career in baseball, was the enjoyment of being associated with these guys out here in Jamestown. How to stay young. One, avoid fried meats which angry up the blood. Two, if your stomach disputes you, lie down and pacify it with cool thoughts. Three, keep the juices flowing by jangling around gently as you move. Four, go very light on the vices such as carrying on in society. The social ramble ain't restful. Five, avoid running at all times. Six, don't look back. Something might be gaining on you. Satchel Page. The most celebrated of all black baseball stars was a tall, gangly pitcher of indeterminate age, 
Leroy Satchel Page. Born and raised in Mobile, Alabama, he honed his skills in reform school and began his career playing for the Mobile Tigers at a dollar a game if attendance was up and a keg of lemonade if it wasn't. A natural showman, he drew black baseball's biggest crowds for 22 years. He may have been the greatest pitcher of all. But immediately sought to bring the Pittsburgh Crawfords and Satchel Page to Celeron Park. This 1932 headlines is indicative of the times where the Crawfords would play twin bills and sometimes triple headers against our spiders. This particular double header Satchel Foot Page, famed speedball artist of the Crawfords, finished the first game and started the second game. Both games of which were won by the Crawfords. The Crawfords were loaded at that time period, having taken from the Grays Josh Gibson, Oscar Charleston, and that added to Satchel Page, made these guys the champion black team. Particular interest in this game was the fact that Joe Nagel and Vince McNamara, the shortstop and third baseman, and the fact that Joe had one of the two errors during so the So many fine ball players. Uh, all, the Satchel Page, every time I looked up, he was at Sullivan Park showing fast balls at me. <laughs> or, or running in the outfield and gra grabbing a ball. The people know that Satchel Page could play outfield just as well as he could pitch. We played a triple header down in, in, the, in Pittsburgh against the Crawfords. We were down by automobile from Jamestown, drove down there. We played a twilight ball game at, uh, on a Friday night, a double on Saturday. And uh, although I remember Satchel Page playing center field at that first game on Friday night out there, and he could run and throw and everything else. That Saturday, where's Joe Nagel here? Is Joe still alive? No, Joe's gone. Ooh. Is no. he left us? Yes. He left us permanently? Yes. Yeah. Like, but I could talk freely. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was playing third base, and I was a shortstop down there at P Pittsburgh against the Crawfords, the greatest doggone black team, color team that uh, I ever saw. And Satchel was in center field. And they beat us on Friday night. Now, the, the first game was a doubleheader on Saturday. Yeah. We were up by one, and this guy from over here, Forestville, right Wolf was a pitcher with the center up there. This, I think it was Chesterton or something. Is that, that name? Big strong. Charleston. Charleston. He was playing. He was playing first base, and he was up there. He popped one over behind third base, and I was over there ready to get it. And Joe come over. I'll take it. And he got hit in the head with a goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wanted to speak freely. Joe, forgive me. <laughs> I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> But he, he then that Charleston, Charleston on the next pitch drove it out of the ballpark and beat us 2-1. That was the only one of the three games we could have won that, that series. <laughs> but Joe was my friend and my buddy, a good third baseman. The guy that I used to be full all the time. Yeah. Yeah, they have some beautiful crowds up there. The Homestead Grays would come in. Them guys were terrific. Some of the black guys, they were good ball players. The catcher was set down and what did he step? He showed his ball up, he saw the ball, he hit it right smack in there. Very good. Yeah. Whenever the Olmstead Grays or the Pittsburgh Crawfords came in, could always count on the game being two to one or one to nothing. It was always a pitching battle. It was never a slugfest yeah. <laughs> because they had good pitchers too. You know, they were a good ball club. You know, the Homestead Grays. I remember they had the shortstop that uh, John McGraw said many times he wished he could have given them a coat of whitewash. That was that back long before the blacks could, uh, were eligible to, yeah. to play. But. Uh, <laughs> Ye shall not round the corners of thy head, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27. To make a profit off his visitors, Purnell built himself an amusement park, and in 1910 began staging baseball games.
more than three decades, the House of David was a sensation in small towns all across the country, taking on semi-pro clubs, industrial leagues, and barnstorming black teams. Managed by Purnell's wife, whom sports writers named Queen Mary, they dazzled crowds with their pepper game routine, trounced local teams, and from time to time featured big leaguers in unconvincing disguises. Billy Webb, not to be undone, brought in the House of David, which included the famed Grover Cleveland, Alexander. This July 12, 1934 game was highlighted by the appearance of Grover Cleveland Alexander, who pitched the first inning, the pepper game, and the exhibition of donkey baseball. The House of David won the game, 6-3. to three. One of the unique things about the House of David is it not only provided the entertainment on the field, but it could play any time of the day as it traveled with its own portable power plant. Here, and uh... Barnstorm put, put the, uh... Was it the Cubs or the White Sox? Cubs? Alexander? Who was it? Grover Cleveland Alexander? I think so, yeah. He came in to play at Jamestown and also at Bradford. And he guaranteed he would play. He came in to finish in the ball game. But in order to get ready for it, he would stand out there with the old timers under the jug under a few pops. And sort of a secret. I batted against him. I was pleased to bat against him. I saw as they were bad. Boy, they oh, I said, <laughs> three pitches, that's all. <laughs> Boy, it was, it was great. 47, Billy Webb suffered two strokes. This was during 1935. He was forced to relinquish the management of the Jamestown Spiders to Dick Illig. A benefit game was announced in which many of the stars of yesteryear who sported the spangles of the spiders in seasons past and gone are rallying their forces. Hugh Bedient, Swat Erickson, Leon Carlson, Rhett Peterson, and many others all came back to perform in this benefit. The game ended by the old timers winning 19 to 13, but the big beneficiary was Billy Webb. Billy Webb received a neat sum of money since it was a good advance on the sale of tickets and the park was provided free. Billy Webb sat on his shaded porch in Celron during the game, waving a hand and greeting the players and fans who passed his home before and after the contest. The papers reported that Webb was improving slowly but was faced with the prospect of an operation which his physicians deemed necessary to assure his complete recovery. Only five, day, only five days later, the Jamestown Evening Journal noted that Billy Webb had died the night before. In its sportorials, it stated, Billy Webb is dead. These words passed among Jamestown's sports populace today and imparted a wealth of sorrow. He was Jamestown's biggest baseball figure. Mayor Roberts seen here throwing out the first pitch of that 1935 game, stated that Billy Webb was a true sportsman in every sense of the word. He was one of those unselfish characters who knew the meaning of loyalty and who made life pleasanter for all with whom he came in contact. Judge Alan Barger stated that all baseball followers of Jamestown, as well as those in other communities who have met his ball teams and come in contact with his genial personality, will sorely miss Billy Webb. Like this child in the foreground watching baseball, we salute the man who carried the lantern for those many years when there was no professional baseball in Jamestown so that that light could continue to be passed from generation to generation. Thank you, Billy Webb, and thank you, Billy Webb's family.